Hi, uh, my name is John B. Cook. I am uh, the author of uh, The Book of Weirdo. We are here in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Last Gasp. Here we're joined by uh, Ron Turner, uh, Mary Fleener, George DiCaprio, and uh, on the phone is uh, Robert Williams. And uh, let's, I, I really want to set the stage yeah. about on, uh, Last Gasp came from uh, the underground comics uh, world. And uh, Robert, you were with the premier underground comics title, Zap Comics, the one that really started it all. Can you? Can you <laughs> yes, I this, was. <clears throat> can you set the stage? I was. Like, it was a revolutionary act to do underground comics, wasn't it? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let me let me preface this as fast as I can. <clears throat> uh, it, it, if we're going to talk about the, the history of underground comics, it, it's pretty important. To, to, to look at the world uh, prior to underground comics and see how it was seething and uh, boiling and whatnot. <clears throat> the, we had, of course, the Vietnam War that split the country and really developed a, a, a power push with the youth. But prior to that, in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a drug culture that was really rising real fast. And a lot of this come out of uh, what could crudely be referred to as the beatnik trend that was happening around the United States uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And uh, use on the college campuses were starting to use a lot of drugs in the early 60s, late 50s and early 60s. Progressive jazz had a part, part to do with the, the changing uh, landscape, and so was uh, uh, the, the the use of abstract expressionism of uh, just um, open things up wide open to be as uh, free and easy and drug related as possible. So prior to the what you'd call the hippie movement or the anti-war movement, there was a very active drug underground. And if there had not been a Vietnam War, that that drug underground would have risen anyway. And that underground was so extensive that it actually had uh, its, its own form of Esperanto called Carney Talk, which come out of the carnivals and midways of the United States. And it was kind of a drug culture language it was starting to develop. And uh, I was with the carnival for a while when I was young, and I picked up a little bit of Carney Talk. But the thing, the thing was, in, in, in the late 50s and early 60s, when you bought a lid of marijuana <clears> – <throat> where you got that marijuana was from the guy or either the guy that he got it from was the guy that just robbed the the liquor store three nights ago. So you had to deal with a criminal element. So there was a heavy criminal element in, in the early drug culture. And the, the, the uh, anti-war peace movement kind of tamed that down and made it legitimate and made it love and um, um, a lot of social concerns and whatnot. But what it did was it it opened up a, a crack in the dike for a schizophrenia that's been brewing for a long time. And you could see that schizophrenia even as back far as Mad Comics, not Mad Magazine, but Mad Comics. <clears throat> Another point that should be brought out was about 1967, was the first time in the history of mankind that there was more young people than old people on the planet. So all of a sudden there was a switch to youth marketing. So the young people had an, a, a lot of power and they, their, their directions weren't clear. The, the, the Vietnam War um, separated the, the country into young people that were interested in an intellectual uh, background in, in college and whatnot, and then the blue-collar world, which had, up to that point had predominated. So that was your footing for, for underground comics. First came the psychedelic posters. The psychedelic posters as an art form broke away from the formal art world. In other words, the formal art world um, in, in the 50s and 60s was dominated by abstract expressionism. In other words, no, no craftsmanship or drawing. The psychedelic posters that come out in 66, 67 w w went back to this kind of a Dada's form of uh, – layout and draftsmanship and attention to detail and a whole new form of lettering, so, which is completely separate from the art world. 
So it was a, a, a very uh, subservient and uh, sensitive to the drug culture, very, very much part of the drug culture. The next step was comic books. Now, I know uh, uh, Jack Jackson started probably the first underground comic in 64, but the psychedelic posters were starting to aim toward uh, uh, cartoon paneling before, before um, Robert Crumb hit the scene. When Robert Crumb hit the scene, that was the ignition point. Now, now let uh, if there's any other questions, or I'll let other people talk. I know I'm dominating the floor. Right. So you joined up with the uh, Zap Collective with uh, issue uh, issue two or issue three? And, no, uh, I, I came in on issue four. Issue four. Sixty nine. Right. Sixty eight, sixty nine is when I came in, and I, I was I was involved with Yellow Dog before that. Right. <clears throat> I I I I'd been uh, uh, the editorial cartoonist for the Los Angeles Collegiate um, City College, and uh, I was the art director for Ed Big Daddy Ross. I always had one foot in kind of the the leftist underground, mm. so I, I fit in to, to Zap really easy. So so Ron, how did you uh, first encounter underground comics, and uh, how did you get into uh, publishing them? Uh, I I was uh, coming out of the big strike at San Francisco State, uh, very politically involved, but I also had a real straight job. I was a, a doing, studying allergies and emotions for Kaiser Hospital. And uh, at a Christmas party, my colleague gave to me a copy of Zap. And I was stoned and I went and I began to read Zap and I just read it and reread it, reread it about half the night. And I had been a real comic nut kid, really into Mad Magazine and or Mad Comics, as Robert said, and uh, all the EC stuff as a kid. But it just that, that had gone away, so that sort of triggered something in me, and I thought that was fantastic. And everybody was trying to raise money, and then we had an ecology center in Berkeley, and it needed funding. And so uh, some of us thought that the biggest thing for propaganda purposes to make a, a, a statement about ecology would be slow death funniest. That's what we produced. And that started it off. That's how I got into it. And uh, you very soon became a distributor as well. Well, I became a distributor because when I went out to, uh, uh, I got rip off press and print mint to take my comics to, and sell them. And when I came to finally get paid by them months later, they said, we don't have any money, so you take comic books. So I had to take comic books back. It took me longer to sell, but then I had at least something I could enter. The best sellers were Zap from uh, Printment and Freak Brothers from Rip Off Press. So I'd be able to walk into a store with the, the biggest, hottest things there and pedal my stuff behind it. So, so that Slow Death Funny started off as, a, it was an adequate advocacy. Comic. Yeah, it was a, a benefit was book for the Berkeley Ecology Center. Right, right. Um, they, George, they, when did you, uh, this is George DiCaprio. Um, you, uh, you were an editor for, uh, for Underground Comics. How did you first encounter uh, Last Gasp and Ron Turner? And, and how did you start editing Underground? Well, I'll have to pull a Robert Williams on you and back the story up just a little bit. And um, it begins, I'm happy Robert mentioned Mad Magazine because I can remember the day and where I was standing when I saw a copy of Mad Magazine and it featured a parody of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And the first line of that article was, my name is Fishmeal. Now, I remember <laughs> that <laughs> sentence in that moment, and that separated the straight world and this other cuckoo world that I wanted to go in, where people would, you know, parody something so well. And um, it just naturally funneled into, I, this is on the East Coast, I did a couple of comics, and while I was doing that, I figured, well, I better find out a technique of marketing them on the West Coast. So I printed up 
uh, some copies on surplus paper from the office of the mayor where I worked and um, uh, bound them up and uh, decided to market them on the West Coast. And that's the way I, uh, Ron and I berated our business together. I'll put it that way. Uh, was this <laughs> George, was this Greaser Comics? Yes, it was. Wow, you really are something else. You're really on it. Yes, it was Greaser Comics, and the first edition is printed on very good paper. Uh, I forget the number of the stock it was printed on. And then the second printing of it, Ron took over, and that was on regular pulp comic paper. But um, it got me started, and uh, I was lucky enough to run into Ron and uh, it almost got you finished. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's that's how uh, we started up, and I was working in tandem with Ron in Los Angeles while he was working in uh, San Francisco. But we, I met immediately upon moving to California. I met so many wonderful people. It was my luck. The first person I visited was Robert Williams, just because he was kind enough to uh, answer a piece of fan mail for me. And I met Von Baudet uh, almost right away and I knew Ark from, from New York. So I was right in the belly of the beast almost immediately um, upon moving into LA. I was in it. <laughs> so, so you were, you were, uh, you were staying in contact with Ron. Did you move up to the San Francisco area? Or no, you stayed in LA? No, Ron handled that very well. Uh, I would come up and visit and swap stuff off and, and go to the Comic Cons, but uh, LA was my turf. I was uh, <laughs> I was the guy who was selling uh, a lot of things for Last Gasp in LA and doing book signings and things like that. Right. Um, eventually, eventually, there was a company called Mighty Leonardo, as I recall. That's right. That's right. Then we first started off with that. And then we changed. Ron and I decided to combine forces and uh, create a corporate entity called Yenser and Ganeth. That was uh, on our um, receipt pads, Yenser and Ganeth, which means thief and scumbag or something like that in Yiddish. That's <laughs> it's, it's on the bicentennial gross house. <laughs> I, I noticed that. I asked that, uh, and Ron, Ron oh, yeah. explained it to me. It was hilarious. Yeah. So you know, the, also, right now there was an image. Oh, there's my centennial gross house. Yeah. I always liked the back cover too. Uh, the back cover was uh, Jim Himes had a uh, great moments in American history where he had a, a couple looking at a uh, a condom that was leaking and saying, <laughs> you know, this this is like. When, this is how we got Richard Nixon, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All ages. <laughs> All ages. Here we go. All ages. So you can, see, you can see the up the upper left hand corner of the bicentennial gross house is the scale <laughs> that has a pound of flesh being balanced by the money. That's true. <laughs> and the, on the bottom is a our motto is never fall in love with your stock. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Bill. Imagine I got that from some guy, some guy we bought a suit off of. We had to go to the Magic uh, Castle in LA to see a magic show. And, but you can't get in there without a suit on. So we had to go find a suit. So we found a suit for like 10 bucks, something like that. And, uh, and this guy said, told us, he says, remember, never fall in love with your stock. We thought that was a perfect model for bison. Yep. Get Never get high money. in your own supply, right? <laughs> hey, hey, Bill, Bill, how, uh, Bill Stout, how old were you when you did this cover? Oh, let's see, 1976. Twelve. Yeah, twenty. I'm guessing twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. So uh, I was born, I was born in '49. Right. Did you want to? Um, was that a, a desire of yours to to work in undergrounds? Uh, well, I did an underground comic in 1967. I was at art school at the Chenard Art Institute, also known as Cal Arts. And there was a commotion in the, stu in the school patio. And uh, 
it was these two guys, General Hershey Bar and General Wastemoreland. They were two street characters who dressed up in funny uniforms and hair. Yeah, I remember so, them well. Wastemoreland, yeah, too. They had little uh, jet they planes. They the protests in San Francisco, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they were asking around if there was, they wanted someone to draw a comic book for them. And uh, I was already known as the one guy at school who liked comics. And so they pointed them my way. And so we did a deal where uh, we divided everything by thirds. I got a third, they got a, th uh, and each of those two guys got a third. It was a comic, I drew it in one weekend. It was called Those Lovable Peace Nuts, and it starred them. And then they used to run the individual panels on a weekly basis in the LA Free Press. And uh, I didn't make any money on it because they found out uh, when it was time to pay me that Actually, they said, well, hippies don't have any money, so we just give the comics away for free. So I got a third of nothing. <laughs> my, my first valuable business lesson. Wow. So uh, and it was actually Jim Evans, uh, an artist who I had met through a rock festival, uh, who showed me my first underground comics. And when I read the Joe Blow story by Robert Crumb, I was just blown away. At that moment, it was a revelation. It was an epiphany. I thought, oh my God, you can do anything with comics now. It just opened the doors to everything. It was just uh, phenomenal. Hit me like a ton of bricks. So I started working on my own comic and uh, I finished it, came up to San Francisco to try to sell it. And that's when I met Ron. So this was your own comic? No, my own comic, it, was, it never got published. It was called uh, Juicy Comics. But as a result of meeting Ron, I, I did a couple covers for Slow Death. I think that was my first sort of official underground comics work. Right. So uh, I, remember, I remember in San Diego, Bill, we, uh, I think we spent a night at one of your girlfriend's uh, places sleeping on the floor. That sounds highly possible. <laughs> <laughs> It was probably Allison's house. It was Allison's yeah. house. Yeah. 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 She had a, a crazy dad who was a nudist. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it was not, it was, uh, Ron talk, and, and Robert, uh, it was not necessarily safe to be uh, uh, producing underground comics, was it? Uh, Joe Blow had a, had a real effect, right? It was. Uh, a lot of people went to jail during that period of time. Uh, the, the FBI one day walked into print mint and uh, uh, told uh, Shanker, you, uh, you're, you're going to be going to jail. And he turned around to uh, Bob Rita and said, you own the company now and walked out. <laughs> so that's how, that's how uh, uh, Bob Rita got uh, the print mint. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a bunch of people went to jail. A lot of people went to jail, and I, I think m m most underground artists ha had to bear the responsibility that they're pretty safe sitting at their drawing board while these these, these poor clerks at these bookstores and whatnot are they're the ones that's going to get arrested. The, the, the vice squad's going to go in there and arrest this poor girl that's working the counter, you know, the part time job. They're going to arrest her. Uh, this was just a sad, sad commentary, but th th their sacrifice changed uh, the uh, moral ethics of the United States. Those goddamn underground comics changed the world. It's uh, it's very hard to explain to people exactly how how powerful those little underground comics really were. But now you talk to a young person about underground comics, and they don't know what you're talking about. They'll stop. You say, "Do you know anything about underground comics?" And they'll say. Uh, oh, you, you mean Robert Crumb, uh, keep on trucking. So, so this whole cultural thing boils down over the years back down to this, this one uh, sticker, you know. So uh, none, nonetheless, the crater has been blown open, and uh, the underground comics did it. <laughs> they they in, in, inadvertently or indirectly affected movies and television and the, the, the way we speak, and they permeated the United States and Europe as well. So the underground comics had done their work. Yeah, I didn't get arrested, but my phones were tapped after Bicentennial Grossass came out. Really? Did you ever uh, do a uh, 
uh, freedom of information to, to find out? Oh, no. Uh -uh. Find out if the FBI was on there. I was curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I assumed it was FBI. And I assumed it was because of the story I did on the Filipino massacre. Probably, yeah. That was a great story. Yeah. It was, it was still shocking and still pretty much unknown. That was the first time I learned of that, was uh, reading in Bicentennial Rosales. Yeah. yeah, I heard about it from Gore Vidal. Uh, he used to write an annual State of the Union essay for Esquire magazine, and he mentioned it in one of those, and I had never heard of it. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about? And then uh, I mentioned it, I was in a band, and I mentioned it to my lead guitarist, and he said, oh, you should talk to my landlord. His dad was there, and he took photos. Ooh. I went, oh my God. So I pretended to be a, a UCLA student doing a, a term paper on the Philippines. And I called this guy up and he invited me over and he showed me all the photographs that were taken by his father and all the orders. Everything was saved because his father was worried about a Nuremberg on the Philippines, which never happened. But uh, he kept all that documentation to show that he was ordered to do all that stuff. Wow. Wow. And so, uh, you know, during that time, during the uh, mid, early to mid uh, 70s, uh, Ron, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, came down with the decision about community standards for, uh, for pornography and the, uh, the, the head shops were, were uh, the war on drugs was taking place. I, what was happening to underground comics at the they time? They devastated them. It, it meant they could only distribute it to the West Coast in New York. Well, uh, I remember uh, we had started getting into some heavier stuff like, uh, and the whole distribution, the direct market came up, started happening. So comic book stores started appearing all over the place. And there really was a, then a need for distribution and I mean, eventually there were like over 30 distributors of underground comics around the country. But there were big chunks where we couldn't get into, like the Bible Belt, the Lower East Coast, the Southeast, uh, the B whole Bible Belt, we couldn't get into. And uh, I remember, and Steve, uh, uh, Jeffy's uh, diamond distribution was, was strong in that area. And, I, and he was pretty religious, I was told. And I remember one Sunday morning, uh, standing at the San Diego, old San Diego Comic Convention Center with him and showing him panel by panel, uh, Cherry Comics. And him going through there, going panel by panel through it. And when he got done, he said, what's the matter with this? I said, nothing. If we order some, sure. And so we kind of broke through, but that didn't help certain stores from being attacked by uh, people who really wanted to put this stuff down and blame us for everything. Uh, my favorite story was about Justin Green's Binky Brown in Boston. A Boston retailer gets busted, and they usually, when they go and they get busted, they go for the clerk because the clerk's going to, you know, plead guilty no matter what to get out of it. And so they went in. This kid had said that uh, his mom found this. Binky Brown in the kid's uh, you know, room. And said, where did you get this piece of filth? And well, I got it to the comic store. So mm -hmm. the guy opens the door at the comic store and in walks a policeman. Uh, you know, it sounds like a bar joke. You know, in walks a policeman, a mom, a priest, and a kid, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, what happened was is that the, the guy took great record keeping uh, to, to heart. And he had everything he ever sold was written down. And his inventory was all where nobody could really handle it. And he finally got down there and he says, well, it says here, a Binky Brown. He says, no, I didn't sell it to this kid. Yeah, he says yes. you did. He says, no, I didn't. And he, he goes through and he checks his things out. He says, you know what? I'm missing one, but I never sold one. And suddenly the mom looks down and said, did you steal it? And the kid goes, balls. Yes, I'm sorry, I stole it. <laughs> and then blame, mm -hmm. the, blame on the kid, which is perfect because it was the same, virtually the same story of guilt that 
Beaky was. <laughs> That's was right. Comic book, so. Yeah, it's a really important comic. <laughs> so, Mary, uh, what did, did you were you exposed to underground comics during the seventies and uh, during its time, its heyday? Uh, the first time I saw them was in 1969. I was in high school, and we all went to my friend's house to uh, get stoned. And he had a pile of these underground comics that he had gotten from um, the um, oh the name of the store. I forget what it was. It was in Hermosa. Uh, I think it was called the General Store, and it was a head shop. And we started reading them, and we just we never got around smoking the pot because we were like tripping on these comics. <laughs> and all we could say was you were looking at the jam pages of Robert Crumb saying, this guy's nuts. And then we'd look at this Clay Wilson, this guy's crazy. We love it. So uh, I, from at that, point, at that moment, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. But I ended up at Cal State Long Beach, printmaking major. As Robert says, abstract expressionism was the thing. And comics were seen as a joke. My teacher would get on my case about looking at Zappy. He goes, oh, it's one of those X-rated comics. And I go, well, look at all the naked women in your office. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> beaver shots and everything, and you're worried about a comic book. But they were really treated with a lot of disdain, and I never grew up reading comic books, just Mad Magazine. So that was a the cosmic wheel turned that day, I got, I'm telling you. Yeah, so you got involved in mini comics, which is, which is uh, a do-it-yourself uh, at, uh, a comics thing that really is not really recognized uh, enough, I think. But well, you, that was, you know, the, the child of the, the spirit of the underground. Do you think that that was a part of the the chemistry that was taking place? Well, yeah, of course, because not only you know could you draw what you wanted, but you could print it the way you wanted it, and you could sell it through the mail and not have to deal with the distributors or or uh, and, and, and you know, retailers were not even interested in mini comics because they couldn't display them. Because mm -hmm. most of the time they're about four by five inches and digest size is five by eight inches. But anyway, in 1984, a friend of mine said, You got to check out this article in the LA Weekly that Matt Groening wrote about the new undergrounds that are coming and the mini comics. And so I sent away for that issue, and that's what kind of got the ball rolling. Hmm. And you got involved in uh, Weirdo Magazine, which. Uh which Robert Crumb uh, founded. And uh, Ron, uh, how did uh, you actually, prior to that, you started, you became the publisher for Zap, right? Uh, yeah, late, late 70s, uh, Robert uh, had been complaining to me that he wasn't getting paid for uh, his royalties on time or whatever. So, and I, at that point, I was buying about half the print runs from Printment anyway for distribution. So he said he gave me the, the publishing rights to do zero and one, which he was, you know, the only uh, uh, cartoonist then. So he could do that. And then uh, a few years later, the guys had the same problem. By that time, I was like purchasing half of the print runs of the things directly, and the money would go either to the printer or to the artist. And I, you'd have to ask Robert exactly, but I think that they were they were having problems getting paid also for some whatever reason. And uh, eventually they they came over to me and, and we signed a contract, and I began publishing Zap Line, which I did for quite a few decades. So, mm. so for the last one, number sixteen, which came out with the anthology collection. Right. Uh, uh, George, uh, during when the, the the downturn of underground comics, did that? How did that affect you? Did you look uh, have to find other work? What, what I mean, did you make a living from the underground comics? I, got I can't it. think of a worse way to try to make money. I can't, <laughs> can't think of a worse way. It's abysmal. The best, the best thing I was trying to do was laying aside a collection of what I thought were the best undergrounds so that my son 
would have some college money. This is all true. This is my retirement plan. And I, <laughs> and, uh, I, I still failed miserably, except I did save a few things, but uh, it turned out to be original art was the thing to, to put aside. But naturally, being uh, having such foresight in financial matters, I bungled it so badly, he had to go to work and become a movie star. <laughs> hey, Colin, that's what put happened. Up, put up the calendar. So the yeah. George is your son, right? Yeah, yeah. That's my boy. He was he used to come with me to uh he would come with me in the van and visit all the comic book stores and he read comic books in the back. And you know, he recently did a um a podcast with someone and they asked him uh, do you know anything about S. Clay, S. Clay Wilson? And, you know, he, helped, he expounded all about S. Clay Wilson. You know, it's just pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. <laughs> I had to find a, uh, I finally found a quote that uh, Leo mentioned, uh, Weirdo, Weirdo Comics in uh, USA Today. And I was able to use it in the book of Weirdo. <laughs> and actually, wow. um, Colin, why don't, why don't you share that little story of, how you and uh, your friend Leo DiCaprio got it. Oh yeah, so um, so we were, you know, friends, because our families were friends, you know, and so uh, we would get together on the holidays and things, you know, we'd go down to LA or we'd come up to San Francisco. And um, so one year there was a, um, a jam page for a weirdo that was at our house. And um, it had been mostly finished, you know, there were a few blank spots, whatever. And Leonardo and I were, I was maybe about, 10, 8, something like that, and he was, uh, he's a couple, like, three years older than me. Three years older than me. And so we, uh, we were like, I don't remember if we were invited to, to do it or we just, like, lobbied for it, but we wanted to put our mark on that, on that page, so we, we both came in there and, and did our little doodles, and I, like, I did, like, this little, like, uh, you know, steaming dog turd, and, uh, Leonardo <laughs> drew this, like, strange little <laughs> creature, uh, a little, like, kind of a sea creature, alien thing. And uh, yeah, and they're both there in, in the corner of this like masterpiece jam page is our little like. <laughs> and you join dudes. the history of weirdo. Yeah. yeah. Robert, Robert Williams, uh, did, did, how was it? Uh, how was it working with Last Gasp? Was it a, was it a good move? You obviously had art books. <clears throat> well, Last, Last Gasp turned out to be the best. Uh, <clears throat> Ron ended up catching on all, um, distributing almost all interesting underground publications, and he he turned out to be the backbone of this whole thing. So it uh, everything eventually fell into Ron's hands, and Ron Ron had a certain amount of integrity, and you could kind of base on him. You realize if if you're going to go to prison for this, Ron might back you. Ron <laughs> Ron was a, a strong strong personality in this thing. So I, mean, I can't say enough good about Ron Turner because he 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 kept this whole thing afloat. I mean, he he would handle people's comics that I, I don't even know why he would even touch some of these pathetic comic books, but he would he would help everybody. And he had he had an intellectual understanding and uh, uh, an interest in the culture itself. He wasn't just uh, well. Here's the trend. I'm going to jump on it. So I don't I don't want to I don't want to slobber on about Ron anymore. But one one thing I would point one thing I would like to point out was while we were doing these underground comics, uh, we we didn't know who we were doing them for. You know that they would go out there and they'd go out to college bookstores and the head shops and one thing or another. So we all kind of had this idea in our head that we're doing these for really intellectual, drug-taking college students and the the, the, the the forefront of what's coming up tomorrow and whatnot. So we, we, we figured we were doing like little passages in these comics that like real intelligent people would understand. And then come the comic book conventions, and we were confronted with who we were actually doing these goddamn comics for. And it was like these these – um, solitary shut-ins <laughs> were <laughs> so frightening and helpless. <laughs> it was like the most disillusioning thing in the world. We realized who our goddamn audience was. You know, so um, 
but fortunately, there was an intellectual, uh, an intelligentsia out there that did get these comics. But but the rank and file was really scary. Okay, I'm, I'm passing. <laughs> You know, you have to say, you have to give kudos to uh, Last Gasp, Ron Turner and Last Gasp. I mean, there was women's comics. Uh, it Ain't Me Babe was the first all-woman uh, uh, underground comic. Correct. Um, just re remarkable. Uh, Mary, you were you were part of uh, women's comics, right? Um, not until issue 10 that Joyce Farmer edited. And I think I'd written a letter to Last Gasp like three years before, like, what is this women's how do you get into it and uh there was a lull in the publication i understand and, and it used to be uh, you had to live in san francisco to be an editor and then ron asked joyce to uh go through the correspondence and do another issue and that's how she got hold of me and then that's how i got involved with co-editing tits and quits because she'd done six issues and had also had retailers busted up in laguna beach at a store called fahrenheit 451 and so she wasn't too eager to do another one, but I was an eager beaver and I, I uh, really wanted to get involved in this. So uh, she taught me how to cut color with Zipatone. So that's how my first Zipatone uh, adventure. Uh, that's a hard thing to do. I'm glad they don't do it anymore. So uh, anyway, wow. I was women's, I always liked Tips and Clips's philosophy better. The women's, a lot of it was a little bit of faux feminism that really wasn't my cup of tea. And uh, I like Joyce's uh, angle on uh, female content and you know, content of comics, which is sex is fun, but we have to deal with the unintended consequences as gals. So I could relate to that one. Uh, Mary, how did you first encounter Weirdo Magazine? Uh, from that article in the LA Weekly that Dan Green right. wrote. There was a listing for uh, Weirdo, Raw. Uh, a gang magazine called uh, Angel Baby and Dennis Warden's uh, book called Slur at the time. He was before he did Sick Boy. So I wrote everybody and Robert sent me a copy of the issue 10. I think Peter just became the editor. It was the crazy kind of robot ladies on the cover that are dancing around. Yeah, 10. And so I, I got that in a letter from him and that was really a exciting day for me. Of course, I ran up the street and I was telling everybody, look, weirdo, Robert Crumb. And they're going, who's that? And I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> that time I met Weirdo and then I met Ron in 1986 when I went to the Comic Con for the first time. Right. And that's where we all met. That's where I met Peter Bagg and his wife, Joanne and uh, George and everybody. It was great. You know, and, and, and a very important cartoonist who is uh, introduced from uh, Weirdo was uh, Dory Sita. Uh, Ron, oh, yeah. she worked for you first, right? Oh, yeah. She was our, uh, our great bookkeeper. For, she, uh, she gabbed so much and smoked so much that we couldn't have her working during the daytime. So uh, she became our night bookkeeper. She, and she got down there with her dog. And uh, that way she could just kind of like pop open a window next to the desk. And we shared a desk because we were there at different times all the time. I could only see her like for a few seconds every day. And uh, I was in there and I remember having leave, leave her a note one time saying, Dory, uh, the mice are getting really bad in this thing. We gotta start setting some traps. And finally I figured out that she'd been feeding the mice while she was working on the books at night. <laughs> <laughs> so they were getting so tame that we'd come out in the daytime look for some crumbs. Dory, uh, yeah, and then and then was Robert Crumb was bringing in Weirdo or do, bringing in some book, and he saw her, some of her her drawings. And uh, Colin, we have to go back some of the old ledgers because she used to draw in a big picture on one of the old led, ledgers. Uh, you know, good, was, good thing we didn't throw any of that out. Yeah, and the um, now you can't throw those out. This gotta keep all that stuff, and. Um, so, uh, she saw, died young. she saw her stuff and he, uh, asked her to be in Weirdo. She, she didn't have any uh, stories, they were just sort of uh, single pictures, and she would, and that they came in the first Weirdos. So, and then from that time on, then she went full blast and began writing some of the, the great uh, personal true stories. Mm. 
You guys have got to get Dory's stories back in the print if we can, if the, if the rights can be worked out. Um, you know, 40, 40 minutes is just, 45 minutes is just not enough. I mean, it, 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 enough time to talk about 50 years of Last Cast, but the very first comic book that uh, Ron, you published was Slow Death Funnies, and uh, we actually are doing a 50th anniversary comic book. Uh, Bill, do, uh, do you want to talk about uh, this? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was uh, asked to do the cover, and then uh, I decided I would also do a story as well. Uh, relates to my passion for preserving Antarctica, and so uh, back in the saddle again. Love undergrounds. Mm. Never, never lost my love of that medium. Uh, I, I still try to do comics whenever I can, even though it, it doesn't pay anything. <laughs> I, might, I might point out something on the cover of Bill's cover here. Uh, we always, we never had the same logo twice. I think uh, for last gasp, right? And we used to have the whoever was the, who was was in the cover, or, you know, drawing. Their skull would appear as last gasp skull. So in this case, Bill has uh, put up a, uh, a a dead animal skull on the cover of it. And here he's put his own skull as the guy who was the leader <laughs> of the lives of the harp seal pups. Yeah. On, on the fifth yeah. anniversary. Um, uh, Colin, is it is it is it pretty much time? It's pretty much time. I just wanted. I thought that we could end on this um, image here, um, and I just want to thank everybody for joining. But this is. Uh, we didn't really get, we did the 70s and we got part of the 80s. We we're supposed to get up to the 90s, but it's just not enough time. But this was in, uh, in 93 when Last Gas moved around the corner. Uh, we moved to Florida Street. Um, and so this is just a nice image from Justin Green that I wanted to share. The great Justin. The interesting thing was, is that this was like where the original press was the printed zap number one. Mm -hmm. This is Charles Plymel had a studio space in this building that we also were in later. Uh, so, uh, George, it was great to meet you. Thank you very much for joining us. Mary, great, great to you. see you again. I love you. Bill, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, hey, uh, Robert, it's great to talk to you again. I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Sure, sure. The, the honor's mine. Thank and, you. Uh, Happy 50 years there, old Ronzo. You know, well, Baba Ron, so much. take uh, a bow. It's been a Absolutely. great ride. Thanks, Colin. Thanks to everybody. Thanks, who Thanks John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John.